Hi, this is Phil, and I'm here to tell you all about the Capes and Lunatics Patreon. Don't miss out on our comic book creator interviews, including our monthly Chichester chats with comic book legend D.G. Chichester, superhero movie brackets, and our search for the worst comic book movie of all time, and many, many more specials, all completely uncensored. Access starts for $3 a month, full video when you pledge $5 a month. Check out the link in our show notes or go to patreon.com slash capesandlunatics. Hope to see you there. This is Will Hellfire, and you're listening to the Capes and Lunatics Summer 69. Recording has started. Do you hear the sound of far off drums? Do you hear the war and the threats? Yay, the- verily! <laughs> Yay, verily! In a world of capes and lunatics, of gods and monsters. Gods, you say? Gods and monsters. There will come a threat. A threat so great that no single hero can stand against them. And when that occurs, there shall rise more than one. And they will avenge what has been done. This is Avengers Declassified. All righty then. <laughs> um, good morning, Phil. Good evening. Good afternoon. Happy Friday for us. Uh, happy whenever people are listening for them. Um, what I got to say is, so we are doing uh, <clears throat> Thor 160 to 163 tonight. Yes. Which is, what is it? Uh uh, Yo Galactus, or uh, hey, what, what's the what's the title on it first? Oh, uh, the Here first one. Galactus? Yeah. And now Galact, and now dot 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 Galactus. And now Galactus, you got you got to read it with that. Galactus is here to stay. He's mm-hmm. gonna eat your world and say, mm, "That's a spicy world." It was. So um yeah, so Galactus he's eating a lot of worlds as you know. Um, and there's a caravan. Now, I guess, you know, and maybe this, did Galactus try to eat Asgard at one point? Like, was this before when he tried to eat Asgard? It might or... be, bef- it might be before, because I'm thinking we're going to be getting the origin of Galactus maybe this month, because yeah. they were like, oh, hey, he popped out of that cube. Yeah, you know, and it seems like they're, yeah, and this is what's interesting. I don't know if we're going to get that first universe theory yet. I get the feeling we're not, because um, I think this is one of these worlds where we have, since the 1960s, built a very complex and intricate lore around characters like Galactus. But when it first started, it was like, yeah, he's from a real old planet, and he ate it, and he was a monster. In his little box, um, he's like Cosmic Wolverine. His 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 history is shrouded in uh mystery and retcons. Yes, yes. Um, I tell you, those 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 claws used to be bionic, and before that, they were detachable. Um, I was I was almost hoping we were actually going to see Galactus without his helmet in this. When he's in the transparent sphere, and you sort of see him behind there, and you don't see it, and. I kind of feel like that's his true form when you're not looking at him cuz he takes that form when you when we finally see him but when he's behind the thing he's just like a big old you know he's a big old baby blob. Um <laughs> He's like Time Baby from Gravity Falls. That is uh that is my 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 headcanon on Galactus. But I digress. Um uh, <laughs> Oh, why don't you tell us what happens in the synopsis, Phil? Oh, all right. Yes. All right. So. We forgot to read the synopsis. Uh, all right. Here, give me a second to pull it up here. Uh, but yeah, it's Thor, the mighty Thor 160. Uh, all right. So the mighty Thor number 160 from January 1969, of course. And now dot, 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 Galactus. <laughs> Yes. Uh, writer Stan Lee, penciler Jack Kirby, inker mm-hmm. Vince Coletta, uh, inker or no letterer Sam Rosen, and of course editor Stan Lee. Yes, and uh, yeah, um, it's yeah. So in this, there's and it's neat because we have the recorder, and I guess this was someone that was hanging out with 
Thor at one point. Yeah. Although I kind of feel about the recorder, and we're gonna get this that he he kind of you know um, you ever watch the Orville Phil? Yes. You know the character Isaac. Yes. Where everyone is just insisting there's so much more to him. He's like, no, there is not. Mm-hmm. I do not have that. I do not comprehend things in that way. It's like, you know, um, and it's it's it is just this urge for us to to really put things on them. But we'll get to that. Um, effectively, in this, we have the Rigelian colonizers. Yes, who are big head people. No. I got to tell you, Rigelian births must be a nightmare. Um, <laughs> I don't know what is going on with those very big heads and those tiny bodies, but uh, I guess that's that, that's just their brains, and that's just how Rigelians are. Yeah, uh, they are colonizers, though, you see. They like to take over worlds. Um, but now they fear Galactus, but not, like, a lot. And they're kind of, like, being proactive, I guess. Well, well, yeah, that's the beginning of the, the issue. Yeah, that female colonizer, uh, Tana, now comes for Thor. You know, yeah, you know, save us, colonizers, Thor. man. Yeah, save us, Thor. Your only hope. Only you can save the objectively villainous people you once fought. <laughs> but we're worried Galactus might eat us. So come on, help. You don't want to. You, you don't want us poor innocent colonizers getting eaten, do you? <laughs> Come on, Thor. Uh, that is, uh, see, that that to me is, I don't know why we would help them. Um, it's like, oh, good, that would be nice. You know, it's like, it's sort of like when, when, when Galactus ate Skrullos. It's like, no one minded. You know? It's like, you know, when he, when he wants to eat Earth, it's like, man, Earth isn't even like going to the stars yet, you know? Yeah, we may be an awful planet, but it's not like we're enslaving other planets yet. We're still working on enslaving our own. Well, and who stopped Earth from getting eaten, Earthlings? So, well, exactly. Oh, who else was going to stop them? You know, exactly. But you know, that, that's the thing. And actually, that's really what probably scares most other people in the cosmos. It's like, wait, they fought Galactus and won. Oh. That's not good, you know, because everyone else just gets eaten. <laughs> but then again, you know, maybe their watchers just aren't as nice about it, you know. I, th- I think what is it? I think it's like an old X Men issue. I think it's the first time the Shi'ar like discover Earth, and they're like, "Wait a minute, back off! We're not just zooming in there. This is the planet that repelled Galactus." It's like, why? What? What? Yes. Yeah. Well, you know. We- Got mutants and humans. We, we're, we're really racking it up, you know. Mm. Celestials won't stop by. Gaia, the force of life throughout the universe, kind of chills here. It's it's a pretty important planet. And then, and then meanwhile, the recorder's hanging out in Asgard. <laughs> yeah, the recorder. And I like the recorder because, again, like I say, he is just, he is not pretending to be anything other than a robot. He just writes it down. Well, like, again, no, I mean, if you have no emotions and, like, limited free will, it's like, what are you going to be? Well, yeah, I, and honestly, I don't think he's doing anything wrong. He's just no. being a, he's like, no, I, this is my job. I was built to he's like the observe watchers. things and yeah. record things. So that's what I do. And, uh, you know, but everyone's all like, oh, you're so noble because you're, I don't know, not an awful person, you know? No. <laughs> You know, it, it's interesting because, you know, we actually see that same Rigelian recorder, not this one, because the other one was a female, um, uh, in um, the Old Man Star-Lord radio play on Stitcher. So I thought it was a very nice nice thing how oh, nice. they came back together at the end. But at the end, at the same time, they really are both just, no, we really have no emotions. We really have no free will. We just follow the story and send it back to the Rigelians. That's Literally all we do. And, uh, and the recorder's going to go re- observe the battle, and Sif's like, let me join Thor. And Odin's like, no, woman. Yeah, and like, and I guess that's when she winds up down on Earth with the whole thing in the fourth book we read, you know? because it's yeah. It, it, it's we, it, you really feel like there's a lot of story here. 
Like th- this is this is a soap opera, and you know you're not going to get all the middle pieces. Like, yes. I, and part of me feels like there must have been a companion book at the time. Like, was Journey into Mystery still going on? That that that's where you get Sith side adventure, or they just didn't write a Sith side adventure. They just. <laughs> I don't think they wrote a Sip side adventure. I think they just ran out of pages. You know, Stan ran out of pages. Yeah, well, you know, but that's... But I mean, it's like there's not even a real... It's... It is a... It is... Like I said, it is a... It is a less well-told sto- story than the Hulks we read, which... And this is over on our main capes and Lunatics feed. We're reading the Hulk 69 because Hulk likes to smash and Thor likes to drop the hammer. Um... Mm-hmm. But uh, we get Eagle the Living Planet in our second book, I believe. Or is it still in the first book? Um, when do we get the point. revelation of Eagle the Living Planet? Oh, no, he shows up in the first. They all that, he shows that, up like, in the first one. Kind of like that. And they gave you that like black and white page. Oh, uh, yes, that's right. Yes. And then we we get, but then his his story kind of takes place mostly in the second book. Because yeah. that's where Ego has to fight Galactus. And they're mostly just like, well, I'm a whole planet, and I don't want to be eaten. And Galactus is like, well, I'm Galactus, and I want to eat you. Um, but what's weird is like, there's not even any any kind of depth to this conversation. There's not like, I must devour you because, as a single living being, perhaps you can finally sate my hunger. In fact, it doesn't even look like. Like Galactus is that interested in like finding a cure at this point. He's just like, no, I'm just gonna. Oh, no. He, you know, I think he's just. I think he's just binge eating. I'm I hungry. Why going... would I? Why would I not eat? I'm hungry. <laughs> you know, but I think that I think he's going through some emotional stuff. So I think this is something you know. Later writers will explore, like you know, oh, emotional after, eating. Yeah, after he lost, you know, Norrin, he's like, I miss Norrin. Uh... You know, you know. I don't got Norn anymore. I'm gonna I'm gonna eat these planets. You know? I just never know in this era if Stan's just like writing him like a shark. It's like, yeah, I'm hungry. Why wouldn't I eat? Yeah, yeah. well, I kind of feel that is sort of where he's at with it. No, I'm, I'm not, I'm yeah. Not, yeah, I'm not saying that that Stan Lee is writing that depth of emotion. I'm just yeah, saying yeah. there's a lot of emotion to be plumbed here for later authors. Like, why was because he doesn't because that's the thing about Galactus. He goes on these eating binges. And maybe it's one of these things where he is just like, you know, just like a predator where he eats and eats and eats. And then he's just like chill for like a few, like a few decades, you know, he's like, he eats and then he's like, he's stuffed. He's done at the buffet and he just sleeps. He sleeps for a while. He sleeps it off. You and, know? And, he, and, you know, wasn't it Reed Richards who's like, oh, yeah, I know. I had the same Galactus. He's a fundamental force of the universe. Ah, so he be- eats a couple billion scrolls. So what? <laughs> you know what? Someone's got to. Um, <laughs> and you know it's it is just that just that idea that you know you you have a a creature that is eating planets probably it does there's probably a purpose for it you know yeah. what that is we can't know although i guess now you know in the mcu it's oh it's to, it's to prevent more celestials showing up because celestials actually really are bad for the ecosystem Celestials are like cosmic human beings where they just wreck everything. Yeah. And like the only thing that is a natural defense against celestials is uh, a Galactus. So that's a popular fan theory right now in the MCU. Um, you know, <clears throat> and again, <laughs> the Wanderers are weird because we say they are the fir- they are the first beings whose planet was eaten by Galactus, right? But does that mean that when we get to the third book and we're looking at the um, the people that are going to attack Galactus's cube, that that was the Wanderers? Like, maybe we shouldn't feel so bad for these people either. You know, it, it just feels like there's a lot of very awful alien races out there. That maybe it's not the worst thing that Galactus chose to eat them. <laughs> but yeah, I'm looking at this again. I, this, I think they just like create like a stand for Mjolnir, and you know, Thor's just like, yeah, I'm gonna let him lo- let it ha- let him have it full blast. And yeah, and that that does something, I suppose. Well, it, I, I know even, it doesn't even seem because, and I read it. I read the book. I'm trying to think. Yeah. Wait, what's that supposed to do? 
it's all uh, it, I don't know. He says something about agony and it drains his strength, so maybe it's just making him weaker. Galactus? Yeah, Galactus. Uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, I didn't even see Galactus say he was in pain from it. I don't know. Maybe I missed a panel. Maybe one it's of like, my. Yeah, it's like one up. panel. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he just says, screw you guys, I'm going home. He's like, if I stay, I will surely perish. Ah, <laughs> uh, so he does. Okay, so then he leaves. Yeah. And then he goes all nice for a day. Yep. Uh, does the whole uh, Kurt Russell thing, you know, becomes ah, I'm, I'm Kurt Russell. Why don't y'all just live on me and we can be happy? <laughs> and then later, I guess he eats all of those people. Um, <laughs> He's sneaky about it, unlike Galactus. <laughs> yeah, it's like, nah, I, I just wind up eating everyone who comes to my planet because, you know, I'm a living planet. <laughs> what else am I going to do? Um, yeah, so that's that. That's that's interesting how they end it. Like I said, later they're gonna they're going to have to state, yeah, he wound up eating all those people because they wanted the Ego Living Planet back as a bad guy. Now, is this Ego the Living Planet's first appearance? Um, here, let's look this up here. Uh, I mean, if not, it's, it's going to be an early one, but let me, let me look this yeah. up. Yeah. The Living Planet. And then, like, that third one is so weird, because it's just, like, he, he, Thor's not even flying with his hammer in the beginning. He goes just, like, through, like, what repelled him in the uh, recorder where they have to go. Oh, yeah. Well, he could do that. He, he's done that before, where he just, like, opens up that wormhole kind of thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, uh, he made a cameo appearance in Thor 132, but his first full appearance was Thor 133. Okay. So, a little before. So, 1966. So has... Okay, so, you know. So and maybe five. he was much more of a jerk then. I don't know. Uh, you know? I really don't know what the, what the, what the, what the characterizations of all the cosmic beings in this they're a little weird, I think. You know, it's like I'm never quite sure where they're going with any of this. I mean, um, I mean, if nothing else, I guess in this story you could say, you know, ego, you know, the enemy of my enemy. Yeah, and I get that, and I get that, but uh, yeah, but then like the next issue is just Odin telling everyone a story about Galactus, and they repeatedly, you know, it's. I mean, I love my Warriors three in this. That's nice. Mm-hmm. You know, Volstag is there, and he, you know, Volstag, he loves to eat. You know, and he makes the point that you know you can't you can't win a war on an empty stomach. Um, you know, and Fandril then says, you know, when has your stomach ever been empty? And that's see, that's the perfect time for Volstag to say, and that's why I never lose. <laughs> see, you got to understand how the fight goes. Uh, See that's that's again that's something that you would do with a more modern yeah. interpretation. We yeah. have that. We do have just several panels of people just talking back and forth without any actual yeah. fight. Although to be fair, these Thor books are a lot of people talking back and forth without an actual fight. Oh, especially this third issue. It's basically yeah, like we kind of get starting to get hints of Galactus's origin and just you know Odin like oh we got to get we got to get Galactus. We have to prepare for the battle for with Galactus. Because we got to the end of this one. I got to the end of this one. I'm like, wait, that's it? Yeah, when it's weird because, I mean, clearly Odin is like, I got to be ready. I got to fight Galactus. I'm the Sky Father. That's the story, you know. Um, but it's like, at no point do I really feel like Galactus is coming to Asgard. Like, maybe he came to Asgard in the past. And I have to think that they had to repel Galactus at one point because um, he tried to eat Asgard. Uh, and now they're just, you know, much like the Regellians who are like, no, man, he can't see us yet, but our systems are breaking down. We're not going to be able to hide forever. We need to figure out a way to defeat him. Yeah. And so why don't we get a champion like you, Thor? Again, even though we fought a lot in the past, you know, you don't want Galactus to eat us, right? You know, we're just a nice group of, of, of evil aliens who colonize people and oppress them. But that doesn't mean we should be eaten by Galactus now, does it? Well, again, I think th this is the era of, you know, heroes don't let anyone die, even the bad guys. 
Yeah, and I guess so. And then, you know, they're like, hey, you know, Thor, yeah, helped us out. But he doesn't really. That's the thing. That's what's weird to me about it. It's like he doesn't really help them out, I guess, except possibly show them, oh, you can repel Galactus. Here's a thing you can do. And now they just have that weapon in their arsenal now, you know? But it was his hammer. It was his hammer. They're super scientists. They can make another. They hammer. like put it on a tri. I guess the 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 recoil was so much they had to like put it on a tripod or something. But that's pretty much what they do. They put yeah. the hammer on the tripod and you know Thor lets it rip. Yeah, I wasn't. And again, I'm not quite. I'm not quite sure what that was about. I, I don't. Maybe the device actually did something. I, I know, you know, I swear, Kurt, you know, and in, in years to come, they would, you know, Thor would be like, oh, I can channel some of my godly life force through it or something. But no, it's just like, yeah. oh, hey, going to point the hammer at him. Yeah. Wow. Well, because that's, I mean, that's what Kirby did. He just wrote a bunch of pictures and Stanley would say, I don't remember us talking about any of these pictures, uh, Jack. It sure looks pretty, Jack. <laughs> it looks pretty, but now I got to write a story about it. And, uh, <laughs> Excelsior. Anyway, yeah, so we get the origin of Galactus. Galactus, super, super baby. Um, well, we first start getting hints, you know, just him popping out of that cube. But yeah, well, it's a well, no, they say, and clearly they recognize it's an incubod. Yeah. For basically, it's what you it's what you grow monsters in, and they basically make that statement. Oh, that's an incubod that you grow giant monsters in. So at this point, for all we know, it is just a giant Galactus is just, you know, Godzilla, you know, <laughs> and he came out and he hungers and eats a planet and kills a bunch of people who then, I guess, go on to be the Wanderers. I don't know. It's not clear, but that seems to be the implication of it. There also thing, and then Galactus eats the world that gave him birth, except it looks like there was no one there at the time. So it's like, you know. Maybe that's like the least of his problems that he ate the world that gave him birth. Um, yeah. But then we get uh, issue 163. Yep. And this is this is weird because, again, did we know that Lady Sif was on Earth? Was Lady Sif sent to Earth to investigate something? Um, I'm trying to remember. Because again, I don't think I read anything quite that said that. You know, I don't remember anything that like says, you know, I must go to Earth and see Lady Sif. You know, um, I do want to say I love the fact that Thor and Sif really are a couple in this. Yes, that is nice that they have that. I mean, you know, they 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 make her a bit too much of a damsel in distress. But aside from that, aside from that, I think it works very nicely. Um, I just, you know, maybe I would have liked to have seen, you know, maybe them a little more uh, aggressive than that. But we basically get this big spiraling spiral of something. Energy or something. Energy, or... yeah. yeah, Infernal mystical energies from the Lord Pluto. Don't you say he's not a planet. Um, yes, and you know, again, as the lord of the underworld, he's like, you know, all about the demons and the badness, you know, very much not like Greek mythology. But then again, you know, people will say that Thor isn't that close to actual Norse mythology, but I actually think it's closer than the depiction of Pluto we get here. But what are you gonna do here? Um, Thor winds up going into it. And um, here's what I found very interesting is this is similar in its own way to, although it's not really, because this is obviously a time displaced point in Earth where it's like on one side of it is the rest of the Earth that is in the future after Atomic War II. Yeah. Which, which is just great that, yeah, no, there was there was the Atomic War, and then there was Atomic War 2, and then we presume something else happened that they just never got to write about in the history books, you know? It's like, you know, by the time you get to Atomic War 3, there's nothing left to write about. So, um, we have the mutates there, and, and, you know, very, very well-placed signs for the for visiting tourists 
to understand what a mutate is about how they were humans and then they became semi mutates and then full mutates. Yes, I love that handy poster that explains it's, it to you. Yeah, yeah, it's very it's very convenient. And uh, you know, as it turns out, you know, Pluto has gone to the future. You know, which is one of these things you gotta love. Just just how 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 impressive Kang is supposed to be. And yet these gods, they just go to the future all the time. What the heck, like, you know? Again, it's how it's how many possible futures come. On. Mm. Like I said, but he found the one that has the mutates, gets his mutate army. He's gonna bring him back to I guess attack Earth. I guess that's the plan. Um but you know, and again, clearly, you know, the mutates are no threat for Thor. Yeah. Which of course is always the basic problem in these kind of situations, because if you're not a threat to Thor, what are you gonna do when you have to face the rest of the Avengers on the other side? Not to mention everybody else. And like humans in the future may have been less warlike. There's a bunch of army men out there that are like very, very warlike, just waiting, just waiting for you to come across. Got their mortar shells and their machine guns. They are ready to shoot you. Um, yeah, but Pluto's, so, do, uh, Pluto's doing stuff because I think he even says, you know, he's conjuring weapons for these uh, <clears throat> mutants and stuff. Yeah, and that's fine, I guess. I just, you know, I'm. I I, I would think that Pluto should have had a better plan. Um, mm -hmm. But what it does remind me of is is the Fantastic Four story where the big black dome shows up over um, Central City and it's like the time passes so much faster within the dome. Yeah. And then when you go inside it, they're all worship fanta the Fantastic Four and all that. One of my favorite uh, Fantastic Four stories, that's a John Byrne one. Oh, yeah. Uh, classic, classic. Uh, and again, you have the idea that, you know, one of the characters goes near it and then they get sucked into it. And are held prisoner, and then everyone else has to go in to try and solve it. So you know, it's it's you know, I always like when you can see those parallels in storytelling. But um, yeah, as it turns out, Pluto's like you know, dude, I command the entire underworld. You know, I won't say I'm a, I, I'm not, may not be a Sky Father, but I'm like the equal power level to a Sky Father because I rule all of the realm of the dead. So yeah, you little godling are no threat to me. Like Odin might 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 smack me back, but Thor, you are not going to be doing it. And that's kind of where we leave it, I think. I don't think we get Thor breaking out of that, do we? He's like No, him and Sif get like knocked out, but uh Yeah. This will be Thor tenued. <laughs> yes, but uh, but that final panel, who's in that cocoon? Oh goodness. Is that Adam Warlock before he becomes Adam Warlock? Is that him? Yes, I just did some quick homework. Uh, yes, this is that uh, we're about to get his second appearance after his first appearance in Fantastic Four sixty six and sixty seven. So, so what, is he still him here, or is he going to be Adam Warlock after this? Ah, uh, I don't know. We'll have to find out. Because <laughs> I know when he, or maybe that's her. Is that her? No, I think it. I no, no. I looked it up. And then it, there was it, her. It's him. It's him. It's him. It's him. Whatever her name he's going yeah. by, it's him. Yes. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing that in two weeks because next week we're talking for Love and Thunder. That's right. With special guest Little Hellfire. Yay! And uh, and in the meantime, we got some other Avengers books to talk. Heck yeah. Um, Avengers books. Speaking about Avengers in the future, did you read Avengers 2099, Spider Man 2099 Exodus? Yep. Yes, sir. Yes, I really liked this book. Oh, yeah. Um, I especially like the fact that Moon Knight's a zombie now. <laughs> and it's yeah, like, I... no, man, you killed like that person. But guess what? That just means like I get to be all conscious you all the time. And <laughs> just hop right in and kill you all. That's just, that's just awesome and fun. Um, and then I guess he resurrects the future Avengers because they were killed by the Masters of Evil. Well, were they were they were they, were they the t descendants of them? That's that's the thing. I don't know because it seems like like he's resurrected, but it seems to me like you know it's a it's a different Hulk. Well, no, it's the same Hulk, but I don't know. But again, he's a Hulk because even he mentions to Radioactive Man, 
I thought you were like a gamma ghost or something, but mm. you're like actually, you know, you're real. That 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 popping sound you hear is quite real. Um, so I appreciate that, but I kind of got the impression in this. I mean, maybe he's resurrecting them, but it seemed like like they had killed other other people, like they had killed the Captain Marvel's father. They had corrupt. They had killed yeah. Wave's people. They had you know, corrupted Arrow's students. And, you know, and we have uh, Roberta Mendez, the Captain America, who now has her own trigger warnings. So she's awesome. And and I just love, you know, the the Masters of Evil show up to take, because they have, I guess it's the Celestial Garden that they have here, just, you know, producing all this magical stuff. And um, they get pretty much beaten up by the by the resurrected Avengers or the new Avengers, the returning Avengers twenty ninety nine. And um, yeah, my favorite part in this is when Spider Man tries to unmask Zemo. Yeah, he's like, "That's not a mask. <laughs> it's not a mask." Oh, that did not end well. And poor McGill, he's like, "Oh wow, I didn't know." Um, but also when he's saying it's not a mask, <laughs> maybe that's the same. It's like really, it's because even of course the original Zemo had it stuck to his face. It's yeah, like, true. It don't come off. Why don't you understand that? But as we see, this was this was this was Norman's plan all along. That he he knew. He had to get the Masters of Evil out of the way, so he 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 stopped paying them their debts, so they would come back to do it. And he knew the Avengers would rise to defeat him. But again, it's one of these situations where is that a long term viable plan, Norman Osborn? Because now we just have more Avengers again, and you still don't have control of the Garden. So it's like I'm not sure you thought this plan through, Norman. I don't know. Do you got a book you want to throw out there, Phil? Uh, yeah, uh, Captain America: Symbol of Truth, number two. Ooh, what happens in that one? I did not get the chance to read it yet. Oh, well, uh, Sam Sam uh, invades Latveria and uh, fr- frees a frees a prisoner who helps him on his uh, trip. Wade Wilson. Yay, Wade! Are they going to have a buddy team up now? Uh, it's kind of what a lot of this issue was. <laughs> Okay. Well, that's good. Uh, you know, Wade's got a lot of respect for the for the for the uniform. You know, for Captain America. So, yeah. You know, I could see him side kicking it with with uh, Sam Wilson Cap for a while. I mean, somebody's like, uh, I think someone's trying to smuggle Super Soldier Serum, and then there's a plot something. Somebody's stealing vibranium. Uh, well, Doom's always stealing that. Vibranium. Well, it, it, what's so funny? They try to get away, and then they get shot down at the end. And Doom's like, "You don't think I was going to let you leave? Did you?" <laughs> Yeah, Doctor Doom, and you're in my country, dude. Really, uh, be nice. <laughs> Deadpool keeps making the uh, joke. He's like, "We sound like a law firm, Wilson and Wilson." Ah, that's right. They are two Wilsons. Mm-hmm. Maybe they're just brothers from another mother. Uh, but they're uh, like, "We're not doing anything. We're not doing anything wrong." And Doom's like, "Oh, okay." The mercenary and the foreign terrorists say they're not doing anything wrong. Yeah, in his country. Yes, in his country. In his country, it's like, come on, guys. I <laughs> don't I get enough flack from the Fantastic Four, who pants me on national TV. But yeah, I'm I'm thoroughly enjoying both Captain America books. Yes, I I, I think I will too. I just like ran out of time. Oh me. yeah, yeah. Um, you know what book I also really liked? What's that? She Hulk. Yes, number four. She Hulk number four was. It was good, man. I I like it. I like what they're doing with this. I like the I like superhero superhero fight club. Yes. By the way, I just love the idea that there's a superhero fight club now, mm-hmm. and you know they're just gonna tear down buildings, you know. And I love that we got we got um we got uh, Marsha Rosenberg back, Volcana. I know. Give it up for the big girls. Um, she's like, she's like, I want to fight, and She Hulk's like, I don't want to get burned. And then, 
<laughs> I don't want to fight someone made of lava. And then one of your favorites says, I'll fight her. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's not afraid of lava. So there we go. Now we can have they can fight too. So we got Thing versus versus Marsha and She Hulk versus Titania. And they get to have a lot of fun. I also like the fact that that basically the thing thinks it's a real fight and he comes in and then uh you know that distracts <laughs> Jen to get punched in the face. But they talk it through and then of course everyone's in the law office. And we do get a reference here that, you know. Uh, Mallory Buck does not want to be practicing superhuman law. Yes. And I think that's an important note that we're supposed to take. Because we notice that Mallory Buck has a big scar on her face now. And maybe we should be asking, why doesn't she want to be practicing superhuman law anymore? Any thoughts, Phil? Well, she said she used to represent every costume bad guy in America. So, Yeah, and I think I think it... It ended poorly in the end because you can only deal with supervillains for so long. Meanwhile, we get some nice stuff between um, Jack of Hearts and Jen, and Jen's back in her Jen form, mm-hmm. you know. And and it's nice. I like the fact that she can transform. I like the fact that Reed Richards just always has a a, a radioactive sensor with him at all times, and 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 a spare. You know, I like I like that. And he's, but then he also makes the point. He's like, well, you know, when your life's been changed by massive amounts of radiation, it's just prudent to always carry a radiation meter with you. You know? It's like, I'm surprised you don't. <laughs> and you think about it, yeah, that is kind of surprising that she hope doesn't carry a radiation sensor with her because she radioactive. Anyway, um, her and Jack of Hearts go to Brooklyn. They realize there's a war memorial that that, that that the poetry... And I like the fact that, you know, Jack of Hearts was a poetry major. His dad yeah. was a physicist. He was a poetry major. Because um, he wanted to be an artist. Um, they go to Brooklyn. They read the poem. It's nice, but they still don't quite know what it means. But then we get the clump, 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 clump. Jack of Hearts, I found you. Who do you think has found Jack of Hearts? I don't know. Maybe whoever Who makes a clump, with? clump, clump noise. That's what I'm wondering. Somebody heavy? I don't know. Somebody yeah, metal? I mean, could be, could be someone with horse hooves. Like, you know, it's weird. I also like the fact that, you know, they reference, like, you know, it, it's, it's, it's Black Bolt's dog. Shouldn't he get the ticket? Like, Black Bolt can't testify. <laughs> oh, got another book you want to throw out? Um, I don't know if you read it. Uh, Thor, Lightning, and Lament. <laughs> no, I did not. How did that go? It's kind of like a flashback issue because it's set during back during the Dr. Don Blake days because, uh, yeah, it opens up with him fighting the Absorbing Man on Earth, and then he has to go perform surgery as Donald Blake and basically mm-hmm. saves a young child's life who has, like, a brain tumor. Oh, that was nice of him. And then Heimdall. You know, he just got such a mm. such a raw deal, man. Oh yeah. And then Heimdall like comes and gets him because he's like, "Oh, Odin's away, and you know we're under attack. You know your father left Loki in charge, but yeah, that's not working out so well. We need you back, Thor." Why would you leave Loki in charge? I know. Uh, like day. I know. I know. Yes. So yeah, a lot of it's a big fight, but then Sif gets hurt. So you know, once Thor gets her to safety, it's like, oh well, Donald Blake can perform surgery. <laughs> Ah, so he does. He saves her life with surgery. That's right. Well, that's nice. So Donald Blake actually saves. See, and this is why Donald Blake got such a raw deal in all of this. I know. It's like why they they need to fix that Donald Blake story. It's you know it reminds me of like I don't know if you watch Doctor Who, but you know um, the character Donna, who was I think that was the tenth Doctor, um, and you know. She gets like the doctor. She like merges with the doctor, and she has like all of the doctor's memories. But the only way that she can stay alive is they have to erase everything that she once was. Like uh. she, she can't remember her time with the doctor. She can't remember her adventures. She only remembers her life as you know a lady, you know, just a middle class lady from England. And it's like, and it's like, oh my gosh, that's a fate worse than death. 
And, you know, not that, you know, being a middle, middle, middle class lady from England is a horrible life. But, you know, when you've been to the stars and then we just have to make her forget all about that. And it's like, oh, she did not deserve that. And Donald Blake didn't deserve no, and, to just and, be forgotten about, to be, to be, to be made non-existent. It's just so weird because I don't know if they had, anyone has a real handle on who Donald Blake was. Because at first they were like two separate beings, but it, like as time went on, it seemed like more and more it was just four changing forms, you know? Yeah, it it gets weird. It's it's always weird with it's always weird with Odin. Mm-hmm. Odin's weird, man. What is your question, Tristan? It's about. Okay, it's fine. You can talk. It should have, yes. There's no reason for it to have burst out of the back of his head. This is how Black Bolt, when he makes the the, the the sound, it blows out the back of his head instead of going out of his mouth. Because why should his brain and, and, and back of his head skin be more be less resilient than his actual face skin? Bad luck hex powers. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's I guess that's your answer for everything, you know. It's I like, guess because it was Wanda Hex stuff. Like, how Doesn't it change probabilities? So it's like, oh hey, all of a sudden his back yeah. of his head got real soft. Like, yeah. Well, I mean, well, because he's super resilient. So it's like it was a lot for it to do. I mean, there's a lot of things you could look at it, but and and honestly, what you could even argue is that it wasn't even his mouth that his mouth that him losing his mouth didn't actually happen but it was what black bolt perceived happening mm. and perceived it that he couldn't release his power yeah. and that's what made his head explode that it that it was really just a simple mind trick not what? not 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 restructuring reality at all what? Yeah, but you know that's mass hypnosis, you know. But also, what if Wanda actually just blew up his head and just made it look like he accidentally blew up his own head? That could work too, you know. Got those crazy hex powers. Anyway, yeah. So, so Don Blake saves Sif, and that's that's the mm-hmm. and that's the end of it. It's like, yeah. Oh, and by the way, later we're gonna turn him into a horrifying monster, and it's gonna be great. Yeah, yeah. The All end the is things the- that we're gonna do to this poor guy after we've. Just again, humanized him amazingly. Uh, uh, yeah. Again, the end is just all them celebrating, you know, over dinner or whatever, and then Loki just sitting in the corner going, "They will know the vengeance of Loki." Ha ha ha. You know. Yeah. Okay. What's your other question? Why did you reinvent him into Big League Two? Because she separated all of his molecules. Okay. Which again, I don't even know if that would kill him, but it's what they did. She yeah. She's Maybe he's not dead. That's that's a good question. Anyway, um, final book I read this week oh. was Avengers: Earth's Mightiest Heroes, number fifty-seven. Um, uh, this is with Sergeant Sardaz, uh, who is the um, the the Soldier Supreme of World War II, and it's interesting because there are parts of this that make you think. This is actually a guy from the 40s. Like, this was you know, a contemporary of Captain America, but just forgotten about, you know? Yeah, no. It, it's it, being it, top secret. Is it that alternate? You know, remember when they did those uh, Infinity Warps where they merged two ca- uh, and they, they took two characters and merged them together? Because they had a, a Soldier Supreme. Well, yeah, well, that was... See, that's what's interesting. Because it's not that character. Yeah. That was Dr. Steven Rogers. Yes. Who was the merging of Steve Rogers and Stephen Strange. This is uh what's his name? I forget what his first name is. Um but it's certain Sardaz yeah. who uh who who's whose family's from Wondergore, you know, got that witch blood. And you know, it's interesting, you know, but basically he is the he runs his own his early his own version of the Howling Commandos, you know, which I do like. I love when we actually get to see them at the end. Cause that is what I think is most interesting, because it does suggest everything about this suggests that this is 
a real world situation. Although I'm not, sh I mean, do you think that's supposed to be the actual Blade from the current run? Like, is this a group that Blade actually knows? Um, because I, I don't, don't know how old Blade is supposed to be. Yeah, well, again, I don't think this is. I don't know if this is the regular Earth. Again, I think it's uh, multiple universes, but it's so well, weird. I know, and that's because that's what's weird about when he's fighting Mephisto. Yeah, because Mephisto says you don't even realize you think you're important. You're going to be forgotten. Which is would be weird if that's like, yeah, that's totally what happened to this character from the 616, but actually this was also an alternate universe. I mean, it's interesting. It's I love it. I love this story. I'm not sure where we're going to go with it. Um, maybe it is just an alternate universe where, there was, where, of course, in this one, you have, you know, Sardaz as part of this mystical uh, counterforce to deal with the Nazi Thule Society. Um, sort of like, uh, what's that? The Hellboys, uh, group, you know? Um, but I like it. He's got the eye of Agamotto. They're trying to get the eye of Agamotto. And he's like, no, man. And I love just his take on magic was like, you know, magic is just getting back up, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And I also like his point about demons is that, you know, you can be a Lord of hell, you can be a Lord of hell, but quite frankly, they're wimps once you punch them back. You know that they they look real scary until you can until you can actually throw a punch at them and then they just fold like a house of cards because really that's the thing about demons they don't really have amazing colossal powers they just make you think they do and they have a few parlor tricks just like Doctor Doom Petty Dabbler <laughs> oh by the way my big prediction is Howard Stern is playing Monaco the Prince of Magic. In whatever project they're doing with Doctor Doom, and he's just going to be ripping on, on Doom the whole time, calling him a dropout and, you know, petty dabbler, not even a real doctor, you know. I I hope I hope he's yeah I hope he's not Doctor Doom. No, he wouldn't be Doctor Doom. No, no, no. no. no he said he's doing that Doctor Doom project, and you know, dealing yeah. with Marvel, it's like uh, they're giving again. It sounds like they have cast him in a relatively small role but that yeah. you know he still has to show up for yeah and you know they're gonna fly him out there they're gonna do this thing with him and all this kind of stuff and like i said i think he would be a perfect monaco prince of magic you know mm -hmm. yeah just just a just a crusty old you know 1940s wizard who's just over all of you idiots you know you're all morons uh, oh hey, so you didn't read uh iron man hellcat annual number no, one i did not get the chance to the, it's because like I, the Two books I wanted to read and I didn't get the chance to read them, but I read all the others. So because most of the story is a, is a Hellcat story. I mean, Iron Man's uh, in it a little bit, but it's mostly a Hellcat story. Oh, I can't wait to read it because I love my Patsy Walker. Tell oh, me, yeah. what does Patsy do? Well, she inherits oh, she inherits this house from her mother, and she's just like, wait, I thought this. Her and her friend are like, I thought this house burned down. So they're spending the night, and there's this like creepy talking stuffed animal. But eventually, uh, well. She calls Tony for help because the house looks haunted, but then Patsy is taken to hell where yeah. she uh Blackheart tries to uh recruit her for his army because he's like, you know, you were your mother promised us you long ago, but you know, they took her mother instead, and then yeah. she's like, you know, you were he's like, over time you'd be very powerful, my army, but uh Tony tries to help, but of course he's no help down there. No, you know, it's not really his his, his dimension. No, you know. But no, like I think like Patsy breaks them free, and then at the end we see it's like, oh well, guess who the spirit was in the creepy uh, talking stuffed animal? Uh, son of Satan. Yep. 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 Son of... <laughs> you know he still loves her. It's like he's like you know he's a bad husband, but he's a good ex. You know, I guess yeah. that's what you can say about the son of Satan. It's like you know, um, not someone you want to be married to. Not even really that good of a guy, but you know what? He actually cares about who he cares about. And don't mess with the people he cares about. So write in, Charlie Esser, because at the end it says, you want to see more, you know, Hellcat stories, you know, write in. I will do that. You know, that's Marvel at Hero, or Heroes at Marvel. I mean, if it's like this issue, yeah, I'm here for it. 
Yeah, man. I mean, I love. Oh man, Patsy Walker Hellcat has been just such a great character ever since they, ever since they brought her back from hell the last time. You know. Oh yeah. And it just everything since then has been pretty good. Even when they were like saying she was a bit of a drunk and a, and a train wreck and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But you know they were trying to make her more in line with. You know, well, like I said, when they made Jessica Jones the Avengers mom, you know, they kind of yeah. had to put that. We needed that Jessica Jones vibe, that Jessica Jones train wreck character in her. And hey, it's Patsy. Uh, so I love that. I love that. So anyway, Philip. Um, uh, shoot, I lost my yes. thing. Uh, you know what, Philip? Why don't you just take us out? <laughs> All right, kids. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, next week we'll be uh, reviewing Thor Love and Thunder. So uh, send your thoughts or send us thoughts on any uh, Thor 1969 issue or any of the upcoming Avengers comics. Email us, capesandlunatics at gmail.com or call the voicemail 614-382-2737. That's 614-38-CAPES. And remember, you can follow Avengers Declassified on Facebook, on Twitter. Uh, find links to all the various social medias for all the shows we do. Uh, again, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Everything we do gets a video there. So smash that subscribe button so you don't ever miss a moment. Smash it! Including Summer of 69. And, of course, uh, the Patreon. Again, 3 to $5 gets you access to uh, or, or early access to creator interviews, including Mr. DG Chichester every month. I got the good mic out for you guys. And superhero movie brackets. Uh, that's right. If you subscribe now, you will get right now Superman 3 versus Superman 4, hotly contested by Charlie Esser himself and Lil Hellfire. Mm -hmm. And of course, yes. there's always the merchandise. Ooh. So, yes. Fine aluminium. So, find everything at Linktree, L I N K T R dot E E slash capes and lunatics. Okay, and uh, by the way, since we will be reviewing Love and Thunder, we're going to record that on a Sunday. Yes. Uh, if you see Love and Thunder, call that number. Yes. And leave us leave us your thoughts, leave us your reviews. Yes. That's, we may that's... play them on air. Yes. All right. Sun Sunday of that weekend. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, before if you can get them yep. in before then, get them in. And anyway, if you'd like to write to me in that old-fashioned email way, the way our mothers and fathers once did, do so at superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's superconnectivity, all one word, at gmail.com. And, of course, follow me on the Twitter as I live-tweet things when I feel like it, at Charlie Esser. That's C-H-A-R-L-I-E-E-S-S-E-R. -E 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 Look for the two E's in the middle. For quality. Bing! Thank you, Maz. All right, dear friends and dear hearts, you have come to the end of another episode of Avengers Declassified. This podcast will self-destruct in 10 seconds. Ooh, next week we get to talk about Thor vs. Batman. What? Christian oh, Bale. Christian Bale, yes. He says he's, he'll come back if, uh, what's his name, wants to do another Batman film. <laughs> oh, Christopher Nolan. Yeah, he said, yeah, Christopher Nolan calls me. Yeah, I'm there. He had fun. I'd like to see Christopher Nolan's Batman versus Superman, quite frankly. Oh, nice. Yes. But now maybe we need they it. just all, all go out for tea. We need a Superman, though. Yeah. Yeah. Just get one off the pile. Yeah, barely. Join us next week. Yes. Forsooth.